we're going to talk about the history of the archaeology of the lost city, as well as some current um, projects that are ongoing and current uh, research um, questions that we have. So to start, I'm going to just give you a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to be going over this evening. So we'll have the early archaeological excav excavations of the Moapa Valley. Then we'll get into a little bit of the history of the Lost City Museum. Then we'll look at the overview of the Pecos classification, which is the classification that we use to date um, um, the time periods um, for our settlements. And then we'll look at my work as a zooarchaeologist, so um, the animal bones from some of these sites, and then future directions and research um, for the region. So to start, to give you a little idea of where we're talking about, um, the Virgin Branch Puebloans or Anasazis, um, you might know them, were located in this, the lowlands were located in this area right here in Southern Nevada. So, but the Virgin Branch region extended over into Arizona and up into Utah with the St. George Basin region and then the uplands that were located, the uh, people were located up on the plateaus. So, and then to zoom in a little bit further, um, you'll see this map again a little bit later, um, but this is the sites that I'm looking at for my dissertation, all associated along the uh, muddy river here. And then this main ridge, which is the Lost City site, the Pueblo Grande Nevada, de Nevada, that we'll talk about here in um, detail in just a second. So this site was first ID'd um, in 1924 by Faye Perkins and his brother, John. They brought it to the attention of um, Governor Scruggum, and I wanna skip ahead to this one too, um, to let him know that they had found, they had pottery along the muddy river. And so this was some of the first and it was Puebloan pottery. So it was kind of unheard of at the time because most did not think it would be any further. This was too far West for the groups. So uh, Governor Scruggum contacted Dr. Mark Harrington and wanted him to come down um, to do, to take a look. And so he, and he was actually working up in Northern Nevada at the time and came down with Governor Scruggum in 1924 and was walking along the muddy and, you know, finding pieces of black on white pottery, some of that hallmark like Pueblo and pottery. Um, and then that's when they realized that they did have a pretty large site on their hands. So, like I said, this was all discovered or uh, uncovered 1924 and it made pretty big news. It was covered by some of the national papers um, of the day, and it was greatly sensationalized. So it was, you had the um, story of the seven foot tall giants that were red haired, they wore silk garments. Some of these places where the city was 10,000 years old, none of these were true. Um, the folks here, the people who lived here were roughly um, between five, six, five, eight as a height. Um, there was no silk found. And we're talking probably around 1500 years old for the site. And Mark Harrington ended up doing a newspaper article later to try to, you know, set the record straight. But because, you know, everybody wants this huge thing because 1920s, you know, it's the time, big time of Egyptian exploration. So we wanted something huge, you know, to kind of compete with that. But one of the things they did do was this pageant. So with this found, the founding of the city, so this is some of, I um, went back a little bit. So this is some of the excavation photos from that time. They wanted to make a big deal out of it. So they had this huge pageant in 1925. So little few months later, it happened in May, that Brigham Young College, their theater part department came down, um, directed a pageant. They had um, Native American um, Zuni dancers. Um, and then a lot of the folks who live there were part of the reenactments. And so this, this actually happened um, two years in a row. They did it in 1925 and 1926. And then it 
um, just kind of, they did not do it anymore, but they were running, ex, you know, special trips, all of this with the Union Pacific to get people out here. There were a couple of Hollywood actors, though not entirely sure with the name, because I don't think they've ever been able to figure out who they were, but you had some pretty big name people here to see this site of the lost city, this uh, Pueblo Grande de Nevada. So, and this is um, on this slide here is when they created this pageant site, they also created um, Pueblos. So how the Pueblos would have looked. So these are based off of some of the foundations that they had found at the region. So they kind of knew what the shape of those buildings would look like. So people built these to kind of give a backdrop for that pageant. And some of these photos are just pretty cool, you know, because they're from that time period and to have, knowing how the road is now to get over to St. Thomas, and this was not quite at St. Thomas, it was a little to the North, um, knowing that, you know, my car does not like that road too much. So knowing that these cars here were able to make it over there is pretty, uh, pretty amazing actually. So with all of this going on, so you have that site, it has a number of room blocks um, that Mark Harrington called houses. He also enlisted the help of the Perkins family. So Chick or Faye Perkins stayed on as an archeologist and he was trained by Mark Harrington during this time period. So, and then he actually stayed on to become a curator of the Lost City Museum until 1956. And then, so it's from 1935 to 1956. And then his son, Chick, took over in 1956 and actually stayed on as curator until 1980. Now the Perkins family for this region actually did quite a bit of excavation work throughout, not just here at this site, but throughout other sites in the Valley, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Some of these are ones I'm actually using for my dissertation or ones that we have curated um, at the museum. So like I said, in this case, these are just some old excavation photos. And um, another archeologist who was brought in was Lewis Shelbach. And so this is one of his maps that he had drawn of how the room blocks would look. So one of the big classic shapes for Puebloan ruins um, in the Moapa Valley is this kind of C-shaped Pueblo. So you have rooms that are habitation rooms, so the rooms that they would have lived in. You have smaller rooms that are storage, but they all kind of form a C-shape, so they would add on to the end and all, you know, um, just to, well, they'll, they'll just kind of keep enclosing in um, as they go. So, and this one is just another, it's a, some of the ruins of the adobe houses. You can see how some of the bricks um, and some of the mud, you know, you still, you can still see those foundations. Um, at the museum, we actually have a, re a recreation, but it's also built around an actual site. You can see that kind of plaster floor where they would have created a floor to live on. So it's not just onto the dirt floor, it's actually a plastered floor um, as well. So one of the other sites that they, that Harrington and an archeologist by the name of um, S.M. Wheeler and Bradley Stewart worked is a site that you'll, I'll should point out on the map in just a second, um, is a site called Black Dog. And this one was brought to the attention of um, two, or S.M. Wheeler brought this uh, site to the attention of Mark Harrington in 1934 um, when they found parts of a, uh, of a basket. Um, see, pe members of the Civilian Conservation Corps were working excavations in the area. So they were hired, which I'll talk about in just a second too, to build the museum but also do a lot of the excavation there to pretty much save the sites that were gonna be covered by Lake Mead once the Hoover Dam, or at the, as it was known at the time, the Boulder Dam was finished. So they had been working in this region and had brought and found uh, parts of a basket. So Wheeler was not able to actually get over there to look at it himself. So in 1942, they came back, um, 
with Bradley Stewart, who kind of led the excavations. And so in Black Dog Cave was discovered at the time, but they had excavated a pit house, which was an earlier site um, in this area too. So this extends, which I'll, like I said, I'll point it out on the map. Um, so pretty much it, the sites for this region run the length of the Muddy River. So to the museum itself, so in order to have, you know, you have, you've done all of these excavations, a number of these artifacts went to the National Museum of the American Indian, some went to the Southwest Museum over in Los Angeles, which is now part of the Autry Museum. Um, material went to New York, but a lot of it stayed here in Southern Nevada. So they needed to build a museum to hold this. So there was a temporary museum at the Lost City itself. So at Pueblo Grande de Nevada. So this is actually Mark Harrington in front of that before the actual museum as we know it today um, was built. So uh, the original name for this museum was the Boulder Park Dam Museum or Boulder Dam Park Museum. Um, and it was built, like I said, 1935 to house these artifacts. And in this photo, so this is as it's going up, we actually have a couple of versions of this photo in the museum. And then this one's all of these things that you can see in the photo, those are all bricks. And so they made the sun-dried adobe bricks that we have on the building now. Um, and you know, there's been some reconstruction and you've, you've got preservation that needs to be done, conservation that you know, has been an ongoing thing because the building is you know, 85 years old um, and it's, you know, it takes some damage through the you know, monsoon seasons and things like that. So this museum was actually part of the National Park Service initially. And then in 1953, it was turned over to the state of Nevada. Um, so, and it, then that was when the name changed to Lost City Museum. And it's now part of the National Historic Register, um, National Register of Historic Places. And it's one of seven state museums. So it's also the oldest, um, let's see, nope. It's the oldest building in the state system to be used as a museum. And it's the second oldest state museum um, in the, that seven um, museum system. It only second only to the Nevada Historical Society based up in Reno. Um, so, and today, you know, most of that Lost City site is on Lake Mead, though you have a lot of sites that are part of this Virgin Branch region that extend you know, throughout the Moapa Valley along the Muddy River. And so we have um, the National Park Service oversees the sites in Lake Mead, though you do have site stewards who go out and monitor um, the pageant site, the uh, St. Thomas, which I don't really touch on here because um, that was well after um, the time I'm interested in. And then we actually own at the Lost City, we actually own three sites um, that were initially excavated by the Perkins family. Um, those came up as available to purchase and the state was able to do so. And so we, we are protecting those, we monitor those. Um, and actually one of those sites is being used for my dissertation, as well as um, another grad student, um, he's looking at the pottery. And a lot of these sites are threatened by development and recreational use. So, you know, you, you monitor these sites to make sure that you don't lose them. So jumping from the origins of the, um, Lost City and that site, we're, um, we're going to talk about the Pecos classification because we're going to move into some of the current research going on. So one of the things I'm looking at, um, I do animal bones. So I'm looking at subsistence across time and across space, basically for the Moapa region. So I'm looking at Basket Maker 2, which is that 500 BC to AD 500. So most of my evidence, my faunal work um, comes from Black Dog Cave that I mentioned. And during this time, 
you were main, the people were mainly hunting and gathering. Um, there is some evidence of maize cultivation in the form of maize cobs and that have been excavated from the site. And there are no, one of the hallmarks of this is there are no ceramics. So no pottery pieces from this basket maker two period. So I move into basket maker three um, where people are living in those pit houses um, in clusters of one to four pit houses. You do have uh, ceramics and maize. Um, agriculture is important, but hunting is also still important. Pueblo one, you move, it's kind of that, um, it's kind of it starts to become like a almost like a transition where people are still living in pit houses, but you do see some pueblos. You're seeing more maize agriculture and the ceramics are becoming more complex into this um, in this time period. And then Pueblo two is that greatest op, um, occupation, um, greatest population. Pueblos are typically that C-shaped or U-shaped that I mentioned. They're all single story. So unlike places like Chaco Canyon um, with Pueblo Benito, um, Point of Pines down in Arizona, um, Canyon de Shea, all of those are multi-story. Um, ours are not, but you also have, um, we do still have some pit house, but we also have trade networks that are in place. So we have a lot of turquoise, we have a lot of shell and possibly salt that's being traded. Um, and I'll touch on the shell in a bit um, towards the end here. And then Pueblo three is kind of the period of abandonment. So people kind of left this region around AD 1250. We're not entirely sure why. We're not sure where they went. Um, it's one of those ongoing questions. So like I said, um, I brought this map up again. So the Black Dog complex is up here. And so this is part of that muddy river um, here. And then you've got Bovine Bluff, which is another one of my sites that I'll talk about tonight. And you can see how the river runs down. So the sites I'll touch tonight um, is Steve Perkins and Adam too. Yamashita and Pueblo Point are also gonna be part of my dissertation, but don't have that data yet. And then Main Ridge said is where is this whole location for the Pueblo Grande de Nevada. So you can see most of the sites are um, all located along this, um, along the muddy river here. There's, a, I think, a handful along the Virgin River, but I most of what I'm familiar with are all along the Muddy. So Steve Perkins site um, is actually one of the first ones that I did. It's a what we call a multi-component site. So it's um, had two distinct periods of occupation. So it was occupied during that basket maker three and then they think was abandoned and then um, occupied again during the Pueblo too. So when um, more, you know, had a larger population. So this site was initially excavated by Chick Perkins in the 1940s. And then it was later excavated from 1970 to 1972 by Dr. Claude Warren, who was affiliated with UNLV. And he actually hosted an archeological field school um, out here along with Robert Crabtree. Um, and then in the 80s, 1980s, uh, Keith Meyer looked, he was an archaeologist with the Bureau of Land Management, organized the majority of those artifacts from these excavations, and which, um, and then he was the one who was able to identify two distinct occupations. So these are some sites you can see the foundation of that Puebloan ruin, so the Pueblo itself. So you have that kind of arc. And this is just overlooking looking out over the site. And then this is another part of the, um, some of the excavation work. So Adam two, this is one of those that we actually own um, at the Lost City or the state does. And it was purchased in 1981. Um, it was initially surveyed by Elwood and George Perkins, Perkins from 1930 to 1934. And then the site was included in the on a, what's called the Muddy River Survey that was done by UNLV student Larry Alexander in 1973. And he surveyed along the Muddy River and um, numbered a number of sites um, when he had lithic scatters or pottery scatters uh, or pottery sherds. 
So um, Margaret, Dr. Margaret Linus, who was also here at UNLV, she carried out initial excavations in 1979 and uh, recorded the site in the Nevada uh, statewide site record system. And then the excavators recorded a C-shaped Pueblo, which was a descriptive name taken from the Perkins recording of the site. And then after the site was acquired by the state in 1981, another excavation was planned with people from the Lost City Museum, UNLV, and the State Museum. And work officially began in January of 1982 with members of UNLV, Lost City, and the Archaeo Nevada Society. And then finally, there were limited excavations in the spring of 1983 under the supervision of Mary Rusco and Jean Clark. So, and then Bovine Bluff, um, one of the only, one of two with Black Dog being the other one, um, sites on the west side of the I-15. It was an early Pueblo II site that was first recorded by Chick Perkins um, as actually three separate sites. But then because the boundaries of these three sites were difficult to differentiate, a new designation was given by Dr. Kevin Rafferty in 1982 following an inventory of the area um, for an application for land for recreation and public purposes for St. Joe's or St. John's Catholic, Catholic Church. And in 1983, a preliminary mitigation plan was developed between BLM, UNLV, and St. John's. An excavation occurred over um, 15 total days during the fall semesters of 1983 and 1984. In addition, a 25% surface systematic surface collection was completed by Meyer while in consultation with Margaret Linus during the spring of 1984. So this one has been excavated by folks at UNLV um, as well. And then Black Dog, as I mentioned earlier, was initially done in the 40s. And then, but the material that I'm actually looking at was excavated as part of a, um, was excavated by the Harry Reid Center for the Bureau of Land Management that started in 2000. So those uh, mainly um, were focused on the plateau itself and not necessarily in the cave. And so, most, so that's where most of my stuff is, but the dates, um, the features with the faunal remains that I'm looking at um, date from that basket maker two all the way up through uh, P, uh, Pueblo two. So nice wide range of dates for this region. Um, that I have. So on to the faunal assemblage interpretation. So one thing I've looked at is one thing I do is look at pretty much all of the fragments in the site. So I'm looking for the Steve Perkins site, there were 590 total fragments for Adam 2, 903, Bovine Bluff. It's only 79, but there's only been, I've only done about 10% of that so far. And Black Dog Mesa, I've got 400 done, 400 fragments. I have maybe about a hundred or so to go. And then from that, you start determining what type of animal you ID. Um, so you come up with a minimum number of individuals and a number of identified specimens. And then I'm also looking at the percentage um, of the, the assemblage that's burned. So, and you can see those numbers there on the screen. I'm not really gonna go over all of that, it'll be on the recording too. So for um, the animals and the Steve Perkins assemblage, it was dominated by desert tortoise, as are most of these. You also have uh, mule deer and bighorn sheep, as well as turkey, the jack or uh, desert cottontail, jackrabbit, and then the um, common golden eye, which I'll talk about in just a minute, because that relates to seasonality, as well as the desert tortoise. So we have several of these. Um, and so far, this is the only site that actually has turkey present, which I'll talk about in a second is related to um, future research. So with the Adam II assemblage, you have bighorn sheep, like you'll have, mo these are pretty much going to be common across the board. The desert cottontail, the um, Calif or black-tailed jackrabbit. We also had dog at this site and the desert tortoise. This so far, this has been the only one that has been had a dog that has actually been identified as domestic dog as opposed to just being able to identify it 
as a canid, so either dog or coyote. Um, and like Steve Perkins, desert tortoise was the most uh, prominent animal at this site as well. Same with the little bit that I have done at Bovine Bluff. It's the same, same four animals. Um, you don't have mule deer here, uh, but you do have that desert tortoise and um, the two rabbits and the bighorn sheep. Now with black dog, you do, you have, a, this is actually more desert tortoise at this site than any of the ones that I've had so far. But we also have the black tailed jackrabbit, mule deer, the bighorn, and the little cottontail. Um, and with the desert tortoise, a lot of these elements in this particular one were burned. And in this case, a lot of times with some animals, you don't really rely on that burning because it's that kind of you're burning trash basically. Because if you cook a, you know, a, a piece of meat to the point that the bone is burned inside, you're pretty much ruined your entire, you know, meal there because it should be, it'll probably be burned black. But with tortoises, one of the ways that they would do this is actually roast the animal in the shell. And so the tortoise, the shell would still be, would be burned black. And then they would pop it open at the bottom on the plaster on there's um, where the carapace. So this top part of the shell meets the plaster on. So it's back here on the side. You can easily pop that open and get to the meat. So that uh, burning of the plaster on could be indicative of that. So with the seasonality, mentioned a couple of animals that could talk, you know, relate to this. So mule deer, the desert tortoise, and that common golden eye. So the golden eye is interesting because we know that likely this, you know, we had definitely had a winter occupation um, because this bird only winters in Southern Nevada. It's breeding range. It spends most of its other time throughout the summer in Northern Canada. So it's only going to be down here in the winter months. Um, desert tortoise, um, finding these things, you know, these animals all year round, what, you know, they're, they go into a brumation through the winter. So essentially like hibernating, but not quite. Um, and then they emerge from their burrows early spring, uh, like March, April, maybe early May. And then they go actually go back into another type of burrow through the summer because it's too hot for them. Um, so, and they, you can't necessarily rely on the, you know, animal behavior because these burrows can be really big, you know, 10 meters in length. So, you know, you have no idea where these, you know, animals could be. And then finally the mule deer would be, mule deer are not found in Moapa Valley down in the Valley proper. It's too hot. They're up on the plateaus. So it could be indicative of hunting in the surrounding areas during the autumn, in autumn um, when the pine nuts would be harvested. I don't think there's been pine nuts at the four, these four sites um, that I have seen, but with the you know, presence of those bones, that would be, you know, they would, the pieces of meat would have either been traded down or they would have hunted them when they went up for that pine nut um, harvest. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you had this, these modified elements and it, or you had um, shell beads. So most of these are what are called olivella sheet um, shells. So they're a little gastropod uh, snail, basically marine snail. You also have, um, these are mitilus. So these are mussels, so bivalves. And then this is knacker, um, so that iridescent, coloring from abalone shell. So all of this would have come from the coast, um, whether it's down, we know some of them came down from around near Baja. Um, some of these are from the Channel Island region with the Chumash. I know so there's some shell with the, one of the other sites that I didn't talk about here that's called Dentalium, which is more Northern California. So all of these would have been traded in and traded um, along the way. Like, I don't think, you know, there'd be no reason for anybody here to make the trek all the way to California and back to bring beads. We know these are likely traded in as a finished product because we don't really find pieces. This is in pieces, but this 
pendant was an actual pendant. You can see where this was carved at some point um, and then broke. And this knacker um, is a lot more fragile than actually any of these are. We're talking probably paper thin or maybe like two or three sheets of paper is the thickness of these. Um, but we know, you know, likely trade came up with the whole com. So down in Southern Arizona, because those they did a lot of shell manufacturing. Um, and that's also one of the um, ideas for some of the maize cultivation and may, the corn um, uh, irrigation and agriculture because it was irrigation um, to supply the water to those because you couldn't rely on the rainfall. And that would have come from that Southern region because they did irrigation farming down there. So it could have been a you know exchange of product as well as the ideas for this. So subsistence in the lowland region. So in this Moapa Valley. So we know that they relied on corn. Um, we've got corn cobs, we have burned cobs, they're at pretty much every site. We, faunal exploitation practices never followed those seen in other areas. So in other areas of the Southwest, like the Hoacom, like the Chaco Canyon region, as the populations grew, they changed their hunting strategy. So over there, they started with large animals like the deer, like bighorn sheep, if they were available, uh, pronghorn, those kind of things. But as the population grew, you know, you push, you're, you're spreading out, but you're also, you know, pushing those animals out kind of like we do today. And you move to animals that are smaller. So you get a lot of uh, jackrabbits and cottontails, but more jackrabbits just because of the behavior with how they react. So they're able to drive those. And so you get large amounts of jackrabbit bones in a lot of these later assemblages as that population grew. Now here, we never really had that. We had, um, a lot of times the bunnies were more prevalent in the beginning, in the earlier sites. And then, you know, the larger animals were present in the later sites and you never saw that reverse of that. But we also had a food resource here that other areas did not have. And that was that desert tortoise. And Yes, you know, they take a while to grow, but, and, you know, they're endangered now. And that's, but then, you know, there's probably a pretty abundant population of desert tortoise in the region. So one of the things we're looking at possibly doing in the future is um, conducting maybe survey work around black dog um, because since that's up on the Mesa, we don't have a lot of material up there. And so we're wondering if maybe people threw things over the side. Um, we're also looking at doing some work with turkeys, um, the turkey bones that we do have to see if they were domesticating them or at least keeping them down in the valley or if they were being transported from up on the plateau and down you know, with the trade that was happening with the ceramics and stuff. Um, or if they were just, you know, getting the meat up there um, or keeping them, like I said. And so that the more we do with those um, practices, those uh, studying those funnel exploitation practices, we'll, you know, have a little bit better understanding um, of what these folks used for foods and also what they used, um, like how they use the bones for other things as well. Thank you. Okay, we have one question. They wanted to know how many people lived in the area at its peak and are there theories of why they abandoned it? Um. So as far as the number of people, uh, population, some of those, uh, the Pueb one of the larger Pueblos likely had around 100 people or so, which um, is not very many when you compare it to other, other sites. Um, so population would have probably never been more than, you know, a couple, 3,000 maybe, um, if, if even remotely close to that. And as far as ideas for abandonment, 
Um, there's, there's thought that um, some of these folks went north and assimilated um, in with the, some of the Fremont peoples, went east to um, join with the Cayenta people, or the, Pi the Southern Paiute had moved into the region by that point, so by around 1100-ish. Um, so they think that though, you know, some of the people here might have just assimilated into those groups as well. But as far as where the vast majority of the population went, we don't know. And that's, I don't think anybody really has any sort of ideas that have not already been thrown out there. Okay, so our next question is, how do you discriminate, how do you discriminate between domestic dog and other types? And what are the differences? So for this region, if we are able to call it dog, it's going to be domestic because we did not have, there was not a wild dog here. Domest, dogs have been domesticated probably a good 20. I think they've pushed the date back to about 30,000 years ago at this point. And that would have been in Europe in that region. So they would have come over, had already been here. So um, when I when I say we're differentiating between different types, I'm mainly talking with dog and coyote. Um, but, and both of those are canis or of the genus canis. So it can be difficult to differentiate. Some of it's based on size. Um, if you are lucky enough to actually have a, an intact skull, which is very rare out here because preservation is not that great. You can tell by uh, one of the ridges that goes across the top of the head um, and things like that. But yeah, the, it, there would not be a wild dog that we would try to differentiate between a domestic dog and a wild dog. It would be a dog, domestic dog versus a coyote. Okay. Our next question, what were the trading goods from the Lost City area, natives to the coastal natives? So what were they trading for like the shells and things we're honestly we're not sure so there were so many stopover points um so one of the sites down um it's in california halloran springs i know they have found some pottery from here um or from the moapa region there so you know if they, somebody there was trading for shell and then someone here wanted to trade pottery for that shell you know you had multiple stopovers so as far as I know, there's not really been pottery found over there that's from this region, even down in the Hoacom region. We just know that that's where the shell would have come from. Um, and one of the you know so goods that we know came from this region as well was salt, but that doesn't really preserve well. And when you're also looking at coastal folks, they would have no need for it. But you know, like I said, you're talking lots of stopover points between here and the coast to get to that, you know, to get to your finished product or final product. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Does anybody else have anything? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jenny, for coming and talking to us and telling us about Velocity and your research. That's really interesting. When you get to the finish point, let us know and you can come back and tell us how it went. <laughs>